in terms of salary cuts or layoffs uh, that has affected many Kenyans. Uh, the reality is that we may have family members um, or even friends um, who may have been affected and you might be in a position where you're finding yourself offering support, uh, not just financially, but even emotionally as well. So through our engagement with the two speakers today, we hope to come out of the session a little inspired on how we can adapt to change and overcome uh, personal challenges. Before we kick off, just a reminder to use the chat tool for your comments and uh, the Q&A tab for any questions you may have. Uh, remember to select all panelists and attendees when posting your chat so that we can all see what you are saying. And before I invite Fred Kio, who, as you may know, um, has our Digifarm um, business, to tell us, to tell us uh, about today's, today's speakers. We'll start with our usual very small activity on Menti. Uh, so I'll ask you to log on to menti.com and use Chrome um, as a preferred browser and enter the pin that was on screen. Uh, go to menti.com and enter the pin uh, or the code 37304466. Uh, we'll just have a short activity and go through some questions just in preparation for the session so that we can get to see what kind of mood we are in as we go, um, as we start the session, the expectations um, um, of the session as well. Uh, so go on to menti.com and use that code on screen 37304466. Um, we'll go through some very, uh, three, some very quick questions, uh, three uh, or so. Um, and the first one is your expectation from the session. Uh, what are you expecting from the session? I already see some guys saying clarity, inspiration, insight um, is what they're expecting from the session. Um, someone is saying open mind, coming with an open mind. Someone is saying uh, they're coming to learn. Others are coming, saying they're coming to learn to overcome. Um, um, I can see clarity again as well. Uh, so go ahead and just type in what uh, your expectation is from the session. Uh, we'll just get to hear from um, our two speakers in just a moment. Um, and of course, uh, Fred will be on hand just to invite them as well. Um, I can see someone uh, saying they uh, the want uh, to get expression as they are expectation from the session. Um, a lot of guys are seeing the coming with an open mind. Uh, we can go to the next question real quickly. So the next question is uh, one, at least one major challenge that uh, you are facing during this season. Um, I can see some uh, people saying long working hours, um, lack of team sports, uh, work-life balance. Um, someone is healing from an accident. Uh, we're wishing you the very best. Uh, keeping away from crowds. Uh, so those are some of the some of, some of the challenges that you are facing during this season, and we hope that uh, at the end of this session you'll be able to uh, just get some uh, inspiration to go through those challenges. Um, the next question is what you are doing to build resilience and uh, thriving in the midst of these challenges. What you are doing to build resilience um, and thriving in the midst of the challenges. Um, I can see some responses there uh, coming to. Uh, so go ahead and type in what you're doing to build resilience um, and thriving in the midst of these challenges. Uh, so we can see some of the things that uh, uh, you're doing. I can see some guys saying they're having a positive mind. Um, others are saying they're engaging um, in uh, work, in work uh, uh, leveraging, uh, uh, leveraging some of the tools that we have. Uh, so those are some of the ways, some of the things you are doing to build resilience. Um, and to thrive um, in the midst of uh, in the midst of the challenges, um, I can see some guys saying they are growing a hard skin. Others are saying they're keeping busy. Um, some people are saying they're using music as well, uh, fitness, and learning new things. Uh, so those are just some of the ways that you guys are building resilience and thriving in the midst of this challenge. Uh, thank you very much for participating in that uh, in that small uh, session. So I want uh, before I invite Fred Q. Um, just to remind you that uh, you can use the Q&A tool and chat functionalities to uh, send, in your, uh, send in your questions and comments. Uh, and today we're going to do things a little bit differently, differently um, and I will explain how in just a moment. And I want to invite Fred Kiel to give some remarks and welcome our main speakers for today. And for those who don't know, Fred is actually a farmer and a budding entrepreneur as well. So I think someone who is very well placed to give us the introductory remarks because he knows a thing or two about uh, overcoming challenges. Uh, Karibu sana, Fred. Uh, thank you, Brian. Can you hear me? 
Yes, you can, Fred. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm actually in the middle of nowhere, uh, somewhere in uh, Migori. Uh, I'm hoping that I'm going to be audible enough. Um, yeah, so my name is Fred uh, Kio, as introduced by Brian. I, I lead the uh, DigiFarm team uh, that is seeking to change the lives of our farmers. Um, today is a very interesting topic for us. I mean, um, when we speak about thriving in the midst of the challenges that we are facing today, um, what comes to my mind is, you know, the people are likely to be affected uh, by what we are seeing today. And I was just reflecting the other day that um, potentially we are seeing another new dispensation in the world in the way we live, we do business, we interact with people, the way we think, the way we learn businesses. And some people, scholars, will talk about the way, you know, we've seen an evolution of the digital era from the time when there was nothing to where we are. And it's just a reflection point for us to realize that we're in a new dispensation that causes us to do things differently. And with it, of course, it comes with challenges. Uh, Brian has already mentioned uh, some of the things that we are going to see or what we are feeling today. Uh, there are some challenges that we are facing at personal level. And at personal level, you're talking about your emotions, you're talking about your family, you're looking about your friends, your community where you come from. And of course, the other you know, challenges that we face from a business perspective, as we all know, we don't operate in, um, in a vacuum. I mean, we have many stakeholders that we have to deal with as a business. And this scenario, this period where we are finding ourselves into, on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, we have to find the challenges. And the question for me is, or for us is, how then do we deal with the, with the challenges that we are facing today? How do we ensure at individual level we are ready or we, we are convicted that we have what it takes to resolve uh, the challenges that we seen today? Brian, right? Where we work from, we are pretty that we've not, we might not have felt the financial challenge when it comes to, you know, managing to pay our bills, although I know potentially more people are reliant on us uh, more than we used to be. But um, today we are joined by us uh, who potentially have gone through this period of COVID in a different setting. Uh, in one way or another when it comes to the personal. Some of us who are running small assholes out there, you know things have really changed. It's not the way it used to be. And before I, I you know, I just introduce our speakers. One of the way I look at things and the way I try to overcome some of these challenges is really developing that day basis. Whether you family at home, whether it is doing my farming that I anchoring everything that I do. And I'm glad to two speakers that will be speaking to us. Uh, we've got Sylvia uh, Mochabo uh, who will be speaking to us looking at her bio, something talk about me. Sylvia as a purpose in her life. Um, she's dealt challenges uh, that she uh, running an philanthropic. Uh, No, being a mother of children with its own challenges are into us and we our story and more uh, see how much uh, from what I'm getting uh, what a statement
Uh, Fred, you seem to be losing you. Sorry, uh, uh, Brian. Yeah. Okay, Fred, you seem to have lost you. Uh, apologies for that. So I'll, I'll just pick up from where okay, you were introducing the two speakers. Uh, because you got uh, a majority of uh, what you had said at first. I think we lost you at the point of where you were introducing uh, uh, Sylvia. So I'll just pick it up from there, Fred, um, um, if you don't mind, uh, so we can uh, proceed. Um, so as Fred was saying, uh, uh, our first speaker is Sylvia Mora uh, Mochabo, who's an entrepreneur, a mother of three boys, a philanthropist, and a special needs and menstrual hygiene advocate. She's the CEO of Tech Hub Holdings Limited, and she has over 15, 15 years experience in PR and brand consultancy. Uh, she's also the founder of Andy Speaks, um, which uh, Andy Speaks for Special Needs Persons Africa, which is a rights-based uh, non-profit uh, non organization with champions for inclusion of persons with uh, neurodevelopment disabilities and their caregivers. Uh, she also hosts and produces her own sh TV show, um, called NeuroDigest and it's on Science TV, uh, which serves to educate the public on the various uh, neurodevelopment disabilities for awareness, inclusion and reduction of stigma towards special needs persons. Um, in voluntary service, uh, Sylvia is a Rotarian of RC Muzaiga uh, for seven years and is a patron of the Kenya Scouts Association for Makadara South County. Um, her advocacy work um, has been recognized nationally where she has won several awards. She's also the national director for Africa Pigeons in Kenya and the reigning Miss Africa Elite 2020, Miss Africa United Nations 2020, and Miss Elite Face of Africa uh, 2020. Um, our second speaker is uh, Chris uh, uh, Chris Beatty, and uh, Chris is actually was actually born in Cameroon and educated in South Africa, and he's a cutting edge multilingual strategic digital mastermind and brand uh, positioning expert. Uh, Chris has successfully trained executives and some of the best digital uh, talent in Southeast, and North and Central Africa. And he has also engaged with countless blue chip corporations and uh, has been heading the Digital Brands Group, um, a Pan-Africa collective of digital transformation agencies, which he founded in South Africa um, in 2000 and has been doing that for about uh, 20, uh, 20 years. So those are the two speakers that we have for today. And like I said from the beginning, we want it to be uh, conversational and engaging. So I encourage you to send questions and comments right from the start and as we go along. And I'll read them out to the two speakers to get their reactions. So we, so we want to do the usual uh, presentation, then Q&A at the end. I just encourage you to keep um, posting the questions uh, as, we, as, we, as we proceed with the discussions. I'll kick off with some preset questions to start the conversation and to keep the uh, start of the conversation. Then I'll add you all into jumping with the questions uh, by the tools we've uh, made available. Uh, the chat for comments and Q&A tool for questions. Remember when using the chat platform, uh, do select all panelists and attendees so that we can all see uh, your comments. Okay, so we'll get right into the discussion and uh, we've heard what our two guest speakers do in terms of their bio. And now we want to focus on the why they do it because uh, um, the bio gives information, uh, uh, the bio just gives information on uh, what someone's do, someone does, uh, but our CVs can never tell you what inspires us or drives us to do what we do. Uh, so Sylvia, I'll start with you. Uh, we've heard a bit about the NGO you founded, Andy, Andy Speaks. Um, so I think the question is, what inspired you to become an advocate for special needs persons? How did that then translate into you founding Andy and to the extent that you even have your own TV show and you're using your talent, um, the world quality to advocate for the inclusion of the Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian, for that. Um, and thanks for having a, me here today and to share my story. So generally, the inspiration uh, will, is majorly drawn from walking that journey because uh, when everyone gives birth, you just expect a bouncing baby. And uh, the thing with neurodevelopmental disabilities, they are invisible. And you don't know about it until maybe when your child is um, from six months and above. And the disadvantage we have here in Africa is that it's not something that most of our doctors like talking about or bringing it to your attention, or they're not very conversant with it, plus the cultural stigma that uh, lies with the same. So um, currently, as you mentioned, I have three boys. Two of them are the ones who are on the autism spectrum disorder. Uh, one has autism like midsection and then the other one has more of ADHD and a bit of the um, convulsive disorder for both of them. 
So walking the journey here in Kenya was, trust you me, one of the hardest things I can say. And uh, after seven years, seven to eight years of doing that, I realized, you know, how many of us are actually going through this and we don't know where to go because you never, you never get any guidance the minute you realize that your child is special. You're just told, oh, this is the case. Then for me, I always say it feels like you go to a forest, you're going for a hike and you're told, okay, this is the forest. We don't have a map. We don't have any tools, but I hope we'll meet you on the other side side so you're just expected to walk through it find your way figure it out meet all the wild animals deal with it and still survive so and also the fact that my child um spoke when he was five and the other one started speaking when he was three meant that most of the times you're forced to figure figure out what exactly they need. You're supposed to get this superpower of figuring out, okay, he's hungry or he needs this, he's unwell because he cannot articulate what is going on. So you have to grow this thick skin. And uh, the day my child called me mom, I will never forget. Um, and that was the moment I was like, how many other children, how many other parents are waiting for their children to just start talking, to be, a, to be normal? Let me use the word normal, although there's nothing abnormal with special children. It's just that they have different abilities and limitations in how they operate and how they perceive the world. And uh, when I was questioning God why he actually gave me two two children on the autism spectrum i was trying to find my purpose in life you know the way in life you usually set goals these five years this is what i want to achieve i was really trying to find my purpose in life and every motivational uh book i read every time i opened the bible i was getting the same constant um message which was speak on behalf of my people and it, it was not making sense because there was a lot that was not going right at that point i was focusing more on my business than all this so the back of my mind i had uh, purpose to actually one day do it but the time as to this is when wasn't very clear and one day uh twice in 2018 when i was leaving church this lady walks up to me and she's like god said he loves me and i'm like do you know me and god were not in a conversation space because i was so annoyed and bitter because i just finished going through a divorce he had these children i'm starting life from scratch and uh then i was like okay i hear you dude then when i was going for a funeral in the u.s same thing happens a stranger walks up to me and just says god says he loves you and it was still not making sense but then there is one verse that kept coming to me that was proverbs 31 8 to 9 which says um speak on behalf of my people speak on behalf of those who are oppressed and ensure that justice is done so that verse came like five to ten times and that's when it, it made sense, all the things that were going on around me. And I was like, okay, this is the time I'm going to put everything aside and uh, go for it. And for the sake of uh, wanting my child to grow up in a space where the social protection systems in our country will be so that he will be able to be embraced by everyone else. So I was doing that for every other child who cannot speak for themselves because someone who is maybe crippled can tell you, I can do this because of this, but our children who cannot talk, who's going to be the one to talk on behalf of them? And also when you look at the caregivers, you're so swamped that you don't even have the time to go walking down the street and causing havoc saying the way you have been marginalized or left behind. So I decided that I'm going to be the voice of the voiceless in the space of neurodiverse community. And that is how it all started. Wow. Um, so I think Sylvia, for your case, it was uh, walking the journey uh, yourself and then finding your purpose through that journey and also through religion, uh, which as you've said, uh, played, a, played a big role as well. Um, thank you so much for that. Uh, Chris, you run a company whose work is to help organizations uh, position themselves, uh, position their brands. What gets you up from bed every day thinking, yep, this is what I've always wanted to do and I wouldn't have it any other way. What drives you? Um, thank you very much for this, Brian. Um, and after listening to what Sylvia just said, you know, um, geez, I feel, I feel really energized. Um, my story is a bit different, you know. Um, you know, instead of talking necessarily about what, what wakes me up today, you know, um, I tell you about how I even started my business, right? So picture this. So I'm a young Cameroonian arriving in South Africa about 20 years ago, something like that, right? So um, um, I started, start, I, I studied and um, 
having studied there, I couldn't really work because I didn't have a work permit. So I told myself, okay, so the only option that I have is to beat the system. And beating the system means creating a business because it was the only way for me to stay in South Africa, right? So as a young child, I always loved animation, computer animation, design and stuff like that. It was great and everything computer based. So I told myself that I would actually try to build something, you know, in that line. And once I realized that I had to start a business, you know, um, to stay in South Africa, I created a business. And the rest is really history. You know, I was very fortunate, very fortunate as well. I got in South Africa when there was affirmative action. Being a, um, a darky in South Africa during that time, I took, oh, I took advantage of the opportunities, built a business, managed to get to Kenya, you know, and other markets as well. And I'm here today, you know, so... So my story is, it's really simple. So it started from a need to survive. And all of a sudden, you know, I managed to really scale the business up and got some partners and I find myself here. All right. So I think for you, Chris, it was a matter of being, a, being in the right place at the right time and having that uh, survival instinct in you um, to help you start a business. And I can tell you uh, for a fact uh, and for free, uh, not all of us uh, can run, can start and run something successful businesses. Um, I, for one, I've, I've just uh, uh, admitted to the fact that I do not like taking very um, high risks. So I'm one of those who are really afraid when it comes to, to business. And I can see even from the chat, began is saying, uh, telling Sylvia, uh, just read it out. Sylvia, keep sharing. You're talking to my spirit right now. Okay, Gana will ask Sylvia to share some more. Um, the next question around uh, um, around what, from what, from what, uh, uh, you have shared Sylvia and Chris, I guess, is around um, the topic of today, adapting to change and overcoming uh, uh, personal uh, challenges. Sylvia, if I can start with you, um, obviously you got this inspiration, uh, you found your purpose and you knew what you wanted to do, but I'm sure it wasn't easy. Uh, it wasn't easy starting out, it's not been easy um, up to now. What are sort of some of the challenges you have faced, if you can just mention two or three major ones, and how you've overcome them, especially the challenges to do with change, what you had to change even um, as you walk this journey. You can just take a look at that uh, for, for um, the greatest change, the, the greatest challenge I can say was, yes, there is this side oh, that's telling you this is your purpose. You know, some of these things are not clear. It's not black and white. So you're just winging it. Because for me that year, by the time I made that decision, I had laid out, I was about to just scale up my graphic design, branding, consultancy events, and I'd laid it out. Then now all of a sudden, boom, like you feel like you're being sent in a totally different tangent. So that, that change and also doubting, because we, we are human, you doubt yourself, the fear of the unknown. Because you're like, uh, is this really it? Am I doing the right thing? Am I making the right decision? And remember, this is something I, I haven't studied like social work or been in the NGO space. I, I am just this artist, all right, who's been running a business of uh, visual communication. And all of a sudden, I'm entering a space that is not familiar. So that's uh, venturing into a very unfamiliar space and taking risks is um, very scary, to say the least, because it is a great list. risk. How do you split yourself? How do you know if you're doing the right thing? Uh, and then there is always that voice that tells you, ah, so-and-so is also doing the same. Someone else is doing it. What are you going to be bringing to the table? What difference are you going to make? So these are all the negative voices, for lack of a better word, that will always be there uh, when you're trying to do this. Then now splitting my time, trying to think, okay, I'm a mother. These children need my space. But then at the same time, you're like, okay, I'm doing this for them, for their future, for the time when maybe I will not be there for and they need um, think someone else to be standing firm for them. And um, also the other challenge that I was going through was I was just, re I had just gone through a divorce. So you're just finishing with the divorce proceedings and you're trying to put your and piece your life together. So it's basically starting from scratch. So all these changes, of course, there is the emotional side of it, of uh, starting anew, the fear of, okay, will I ever get back fully on my feet? Uh, will I be able to be enough for my children and also be able to stand in for everyone else as I would like to do or as this new JD calls for me? So those are some of the few challenges that... Um, uh, on top of, of course, there is the economic side of it because uh, time is money, man. So, yeah, those are some of the challenges that I've been looking at. 
<laughs> yeah, indeed, time is money. Uh, wow, lots of challenges. And we'll get back to you and on how yeah. you just overcame uh, some of them. Uh, you can shed more light um, in just a moment. Uh, but Chris, for you, I mean, um, I'm sure maybe the uh, challenges are a bit different because uh, by virtue of you wanting to go into business, um, it means you already had that um, uh, thing in you that allowed you to take risk. Um, so what, what kind of challenges did you face um, as you were getting into business and as you were pursuing your, your journey? All right, thank you very much, Brian, for this. Um, you know, for me, it's I'll go back to South Africa again because my story really starts there. And... You know, um, I told friends speak in Cameroon, so I didn't speak English when I arrived in South Africa, and that was the first thing that I had to deal with. So I arrived in South Africa, I think in 1997, something like that. So um, just three day, three years after apartheid, so I went into a school, and I was the only black student in the school, right? And I didn't speak English properly, and I didn't really even have computer skills, and all the other guys were ready. You know, they had done computer before and all that. So I had to learn the language and I had to tell myself that, you know, whatever happens, I have to really be performing, you know? So that's challenge number one. The second challenge that I had as well, I mean, during my professional life, having started the business was, I, I didn't have experience and I had a partner that managed to get me out of the company, to kick me out of the company. So at some point we have a discussion and the guy tells me, listen, I own about 90% of the business, you know, 90, and then you have about 10%. And I'm like, okay, so what does that mean? But at that stage, I started a business. I'm the creative director of the business. I know the clients, you know, so I have to make a decision, right? That's one thing. The, the third thing that might not be a challenge, but I think for me, it was a real defining moment. I was in you see here. So young guy, I've started a business. One day I'm given a project that I've worked on for six months and I have to present, and they don't tell me, but I have to present to the entire board of the SABC. And they're standing in front of me. And I'm telling myself, listen, um, if you don't do this trouble, but if you manage to get through this, I mean, it could mean a lot. Um, just before my presentation, the CEO comes to me and the CEO spoke French. The CEO comes to me and he tells me, look, I said that you're a bit nervous. So why are you scared? I mean, you know something that we don't. This is why you're presenting to us, right? So I told myself, okay, so did the presentation. Everything went well. I cannot, at that moment, I think my life, something really happened and it really changed because I got a standing ovation and then they put me on TV. They even told guys that I did the work for them. And it was really amazing, you know, and I was really young, you know, so and at that moment, I told myself, I can do anything. If these guys that I don't know, that are really senior, and those are some of the major CEOs in the country, if they respect me, it means I have something and I should never ever be scared in my life again. So today, even if you put me in front of Jeff Bezos, his CEO might be smaller than his company, but see, that's the way I see it. So a lesson that I learned a long time ago. So those are some of, some of the things that I had to go through that I think defined my, you know, the rest of my life. Amazing. I think one of the things that's uh, clearly coming out uh, from the discussion so far is um, the, the theme around um, finding a purpose, um, getting the right opportunities, but not only getting the right opportunities, but taking advantage of those opportunities. Because sometimes opportunities come our way, but because of fear um, of will I fail? What will people think? Then we, we fail to take advantage of those opportunities. Uh, and then I think the other, the other thing that's coming out is just trying to overcome uh, challenges. Uh, Sylvia, if I can come back to you. Um, and by the way, Macrine uh, on the chat says, great job, Sylvia. Big up to you for using your personal experience to elevate you and others. And just to uh, remind the rest as well, you can uh, post your chats um, and your questions as we go along. Um, like I said, we will not have a Q&A session at the end. We will just do the Q&A as we go along so we can make this engaging and, and conversational. Um, Sylvia, back to you. What is the, if you can describe the one thing that has sort of helped you, the one or maybe two things that have helped you overcome all the challenges that you've faced, the common thing that you've had um, that has helped you just come through all the seasons uh, that you've faced, both at an uh, um, 
in your advocacy level, in the job you're trying to uh, do as an advocate um, for special needs people, and even just as, as a mother um, of, of special needs children. All right, sorry. Uh, generally, uh, how I look at um, the situations that life presents me. So you, normally we have two choices. The same way we say a glass is either half full or half empty, but it's still the same glass. So my focal point is usually what's the worst that can happen in this situation and what is the best I can get out of this. So turning the negative into a positive. What I normally say is I will use my challenges as a stepping stone to elevate myself, to get a better me, even if it's not for me, maybe for someone else. Because remember also in life, we're not here for, to live for ourselves. We are here to live for others. The same way a tree is planted by someone else, but it's another generation that sits under it for shade. It's another generation that uh, eats the fruits off of it. So if I get into a situation I, I allow myself to go through the motions when it, if it's a challenge because most people um, I find would not want to allow themselves like to feel if I am sad I am sad I allow myself that moment even even at this point that those days that are crazy I will allow myself to go through that moment I am annoyed go through the anger go to the other side and then now deal with okay what made me angry and how did I react to it? Could I have done better? So you see that one is more of self-development and learning yourself more and getting to understand who you are and how you operate in different scenarios. Because that way it then equips you for now future challenges that you will be able to go through. So generally it is just uh, learn. You do not have to make all the mistakes. You can learn from others and at the same time whatever you go through, make sure you don't make the same mistake over and over again. Learn from it and better yourself through that experience. And look at the um, worst case scenario because if you think ahead, what's the worst that can happen, and uh, look at the process of how you get there, then you that means you already your mind has a perception of this is the way I can handle. If this happens, I will do this. If this happens, so you don't get uh, caught uh, unawares. So that's that's how generally I handle and tackle my challenges in life. Yeah, I think some crucial points. That you get from there, turning a negative into a positive, using your challenges as a stepping stone for yourself, um, even for us. Um, I, think, I think well said, and I can see even um, some of our colleagues uh, agreeing, uh, Tapi saying the strength of a woman, my admire, Dylan, uh, um, and she asks, uh, and maybe maybe we can take this question now um, before we go back to Chris and Sylvia. Um, Tabi asks, what support network kept you going um, through, this, uh, through this journey? um support networks you know there comes a time in life you have to realize it is you all right you can depend on other people but then dependency also can lead you to disappointment so i limit my expectations uh yes i know i have my family most of them like my brother is in the us my sister is in the uk but i'm the only one here and my parents also sort of depended on me and the complexity of raising a special needs child is not everyone is going to uh understand them so like if, if it comes to like uh when when it's balancing you have your nanny and you have that but you cannot expect them to do everything for you maybe if I'm, I'm feeling burnt out then there is family but then how much can they give you have to appreciate the level as to which they can give and don't expect them to always be there at the beacon call so if like i need a weekend out i know my mom can be able to handle a weekend because it's not her children. Yes, it's her grandchildren, but understanding the complexity of a special needs child because they have a special diet, they're on medication every day, you find that the way they understand the environment, the way they react, to me, it will be normal. Someone else will walk into my house and think like, woman, get a grip, what's wrong with your children? But you see, for me, that's my normal, that's my space. So do not have great expectations. So I've always, um worked on it begins and ends with me if i get the support well and good if i don't then well and good then also empowering those who are around you so that they can offload some of the responsibilities and uh, managing what you take in yeah so I, I believe that answers the question tabby so the support system is what you make of it but then also you have to manage your expectations that it, someone being your friend or being a relative or having a relation with you does not mean an automatic that they always have to be there so the back the the, the backbone is you and uh for me the greater one i always say without god's grace 
uh, I don't think I would have made it this far. Because sometimes I can't even explain where I get the energy from to wake up every day. Because you have such a crazy day, then the next day you still have to face the world and new responsibilities. So also, yeah, God's grace has been one of the greatest pillars that I have actually had through this journey. I think well put. God's grace, um, having family, but also um, remembering that the support system is what you make of it. Um, and at the end of the day, you have to take responsibility um, and, and just uh, get on with it. So um, some messages still coming through. I can see Anthony saying, very inspiring, Sylvia and Chris. Keep moving, keep marching on. Um, let's come to the now. Um, obviously, COVID came uh, six months ago uh, now, and it's been one of those defining moment um, in the history of mankind. People can't even remember the last time we had such a such a pandemic, um, and it came with challenges. Chris, for you as a business person, and, and Fred was mentioning earlier that you know people with businesses have really suffered, um, and we keep counting our blessings and thanking our uh, thanking the fact that Safaricom have not been hardly hit. But like I said earlier, uh, there's there's some people who have uh, been forced to be uh, to to sort of support others financially, emotionally. So even uh, if you're not affected directly, you might be indirectly affected. What are some of the challenges you have faced during this pandemic, and how are you uh, sort of coping uh, coping with this current? Uh, thank you very much for this, Brian. Well, you see, the thing is, um, so there are challenges on a personal level. There are challenges on a business level. So I'll start with I'll start with business, right? So being a company that is kind of classified as a marketing company. You know, marketing is usually the first thing when it comes to budget cuts, you know, they first look at marketing, you know, and they say, oh, you know what? We don't necessarily have to do this. So, of course, we've been hit. But the thing, though, is, you know, um, I've, COVID has just only accelerated the inevitable. This is what I always tell people. So one way or the other, digital transformation was going to happen. We were going to get to a point you know, like this. And and for me, um, I've always told my guys at the office, listen, we need to figure out a way, no matter what we do, we need to figure out a way to work remotely and make it a standard way of operating. Because the way I'm looking at things is the agency business has changed. A lot of things have changed. And we're going to get to a point where we just operate like that. And we understand also that there are some people that really need that community. You know, they need to be in an office. They need to be with some people. Otherwise, they don't necessarily really perform well. So what we've done as a business, you know, because we realized that things were going getting really tough is we went back to basics, you know, uh, having grown the business, you know, we had some premium clients. We were doing some really cool stuff, brand strategy, digital strategy. But then I told my guys, no, right now we go back to basics. Even if we get a, a request for a website, you know, that's going to pay us 50,000 shillings, we take the job, we do the job quickly, and then we move on, right? So this is one of the things. And funny enough, we've gotten a lot of these um, these requests, you know, and, and it's helping us stay afloat. And then at the same time as well, and mind you, we're in many different markets as well. So every market has their own dynamics, you know, so it's really tricky. But the other thing as well is I realized that it was very important for me to put myself at the service of people and usually that's the thing so in a situation like this people are not spending but what can you really do you know what value do you necessarily provide to people so for us the only thing we could do is create a lot of content put a lot of content out there and it's been very intentional i had to be part of i had to be in the media i had to make sure that we produce a lot of content that can really help people and what that does really is you stay top of mind and some people keep remembering you and say, oh, Chris, you know what? There's something that we haven't that we haven't completed that we would like to do now. Could you help us? You know, things like that have really worked. Um, the third thing as well that I know about chaos is that chaos has a funny way of equalizing things, you know, so companies that were really winning are not necessarily leading in, in, a, in times like this if they were not ready. So it provides a tremendous opportunity. So I told my people, this is the, this is the time to, to start businesses. It's now. Because you can use COVID as an excuse to fail. 
You know, funny enough, if you fail during COVID, people will not judge you as badly as they would. So this is the time to really be entrepreneurial. So all these ideas that you had to, that you really had under the blanket, this is the time to actually really uh, start them now. And we have, and I've started one or two small little businesses, you know, um, on the side during this period. And for some reason, it's working. Let me give you an example. Right now, as we speak, we're opening a branch in Ghana. It's crazy, but this is just the way to do it, you know, and because a lot of businesses want to go digital, want to do stuff. And I told my guys, listen, this is the time to do it now. So we're going to invest right now. And so far, to be honest with you, I think it's, it has worked. And on a personal level, the way for me to deal with this is to go back to what I love doing, right? What I did mention during at, at the beginning is that I'm an artist, I'm an aspiring musician, you know, I do music as a hobby. So COVID has given me enough time to spend, a, I mean, to really work on things that I wanted to, all these little things, my music and so on, just to make sure that I'm always positive because it could, it could be depressing, but I'm fortunate enough, I haven't, got, had to, I haven't had to go through that. So these are some of the things that I've had to do. All right. Um, I like what you're saying um, about taking risks, um, even though the time might not seem right. Um, you've taken calculated risks and, and some of it is paying off, opening a branch in Ghana. Um, it's amazing that your business, you're actually expanding your business during this time. And I think it's because of the positivity um, that uh, you've decided to face uh, these times with. Going back to basics, you talked about putting a service of people. I think all very good points. Um, Sylvia, to you, what what are some of the challenges that you are going through right now, and how are you sort of trying, sort of overcoming them um, during this period? Um, I think I'll split my response in two because there there is the challenges of COVID as a caregiver, and now for us as an organization because they marry. It is uh, the journey that inspires what it is that we do. And I, when I look back, actually, as we are talking, I've just realized uh, sometimes the things we go through in life but uh, we as humans we will be complaining about but god is preparing you for something better than what you will see you cannot see it and that's what we call uh, faith and hope and all that so uh looking back when covid came for me it got me unawares it got called off like 24 hours before an, a major event we were hosting 7500 special needs children on a medical camp so everything has arrived and then you're being told all events cancelled so like I said, I allowed myself to go through motion, so I locked myself up <laughs> and went through that depressive moment because, you know, when events are cancelled, you, you are hit hard because it's one of the major income streams in the company that is Tech Hub. But then now, uh, that was now my work being disrupted. Then I go home, my kids have been stopped from going to school. The thing with autistic children is they thrive with routine. Like, my son will wake up, do the same thing the same way. And if you're going to change anything, we start one week early. Next week, we're not going to school. We're changing this. So they are mentally prepared. But this was like instant cut off. I was not ready. I have to deal with me and everything else. Now I have to deal with these two humans. And remember, uh, my last one has ADHD. That means he has energy for days. And I'm being told he can't go outside. So hell was breaking loose in this small space <laughs> that we are calling home that's supposed to be your refuge. So in the parenting side, it was chaos and emotionally it was draining. I'm sure most of you saw the feature on Citizen that was done uh, in our home setup because um, that was, I think, one of the hardest parenting experiences that I've had when now COVID really struck. But then after allowing myself to go through the motions, I was like, okay, so enough of this. How do we go ahead? What opportunities are there? And when it comes to, to what it did in the fraternity of special needs and disability, COVID has really exposed the gaps. And for me, I took this as the opportune moment now to highlight, because if you look at all the solutions everyone was doing, it was focused on the typical child. When you're talking about the, the schooling, what was done? Oh, we put it on TV. What about my child? That's not how they learn. They're special needs. They need that one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, we had talked about giving laptops in the community. They, if that had been done, they would have already embarrassed how to use that laptop. But then now you're trying to tell me also as a parent, I start homeschooling. Special needs children are not just schooled like everyone else. So you can imagine a parent with a child who's dyslexic, meaning they have issues with the writing or numbers that is dyscalculia and, and stuff like that. 
that needs specialization. I'm not specialized and one thing I own up to my uh, weakness and that is I can never be a teacher even if it's for free <laughs> not for young kids at least that one I, I know the patience I don't have adults maybe but children is not my cup of tea but now here comes I'm being told I have to do therapy at home I have to become a therapist I have to become a special needs teacher and I have to still be mommy and daddy and still continue with working from home, which was almost impossible. But now uh, I decided I'll focus on Andy Speaks during this time. And that's, uh, I put like now the advocacy into gear four in that a lot of media appearances, I did a survey, uh, found out what, how everyone else is doing and now presented that and escalated it to the government and say, hey, you guys, you're thinking about everyone else. Look, our children need medication. We can't go to Mbagathe. That's where you're doing COVID testing. You know, we cannot access school. You're only thinking about uh, regular kids when you're looking at the solutions. So, and all these surveys have played an important role if you look at how now the government is looking back at how do we bridge these gaps so we're we are, we are, what COVID has done it has given us more leeway to sit in the decision making plan platform and also or what i've done is i have embraced my skills as a graphic designer and a pr consultant to do the advocacy online and embrace now this new normal for example instead of my tv show now i i host every saturday something we call special needs hangout where we we're actually having a conversation with the parents what are you going through i bring in a special to teach them how to do like therapy at home how do you handle your child when they're having meltdowns and stuff like that so bottom line identify the opportunities in all the guise of all the things that are seem to be going wrong and you will be able to escalate and uh, find something meaningful out of it I believe that's the long and short version of it <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I think I, I like what you're saying about, and I think that's the other thing that's coming out, about adapting to um, the new circumstances, the new normal. I think both you and Chris um, have, have, have sort of touched on it. Uh, being able to adapt, uh, being able to uh, view the situation and seeing how you can uh, make the best out of it. Uh, is absolutely crucial and i think also um your story just puts into perspective um some of the challenges that uh, um, parents with special needs uh, children can face um, especially during this time when they are their whole um sort of team has been has been um chris uh sylvia uh sorry uh tabby says great story of determination and risk taking in foreign countries and she wants to know whether there are any failures or bad decisions you've made and how you came them maybe you can just mention one or two that sort of come to mind that really uh, i know you mentioned some earlier including the language barrier or but any additional failures things that you've done and you just start back and wow that field sort of bound Thank you, Brian. Um, in fact, when I when I normally sit down, I always, you know, I ask myself what good decisions I've actually made. You know, because everything seems to be, and and that's, and you see, there's. Please allow me to say something. You know, there's something that is being said. There's a narrative about entrepreneurship out there that is completely wrong. Completely wrong. People think being an entrepreneur is a fancy thing. You know, it's a trendy thing. You know, it's a it's a good thing to do. And for me. And I talk to my partners about that now all the time. It's for me being an entrepreneur. It's 90% of the time you you're depressed and you're broke, you know, and that's the reality. But then you have that, those 10%, you know, that that are really amazing because you get those good opportunities, and and it works, you know. So as I always say, I'm still looking for my, I'm waiting for my big break. So in terms of the challenges that I've had, to be honest, the first one is choosing the wrong partners. I've had, I built a business for over 10 years because, you know, we started the business, then we built subsidiaries. And when I built that business, I got some partners that were not the right partners and I lost my business in Uganda, in Rwanda, and some part of the business in South Africa. You know, so I had to decide, do I really want to fight or do I want to actually just carry on? And this is what I always tell myself, one of my principles, if I've built something, I can build something bigger and stronger because I know how to do it, you know? So I've made so many mistakes and I can learn from it. So this is one of the things. The other thing that I would like to talk to you about is, I don't know if it's kosher for me to mention it, but anyway, you know what? This is a closed space, so I can do that. So um, because I had worked in South Africa, there's a huge company in South Africa, knowing that I'm in Kenya, they called me, they said, Chris, 
we want you to do something different. We know you do brand and, and digital strat and all that, but there's a deal that we're following, you know, at one of the parastatals, you know, um, here in Kenya, and we need you to come to help us conclude that deal. As a big company, they have something called a uh, business facilitation fee, you know? Please, people in the audience, don't go and think, um, you know, they, <laughs> you know, there's, you know, and especially looking at the, the environment today with all the bribes and all that, it wasn't really like that. It was something quite straightforward. So the deal was, I helped them get the deal, facilitate the deal. I get some sort of percentage and it was a lot of money. I mean, it was millions of euros that they were making and, and you know, so, so I helped them. They got the deal, procurement made, made, made sure that everything was signed. They even made sure that the money was in their account, you know, and it was during Christmas, I remember, and I had told the guys, look, these guys are willing to pay you this much and this much, you know, for helping. So I get the deal signed, I feed back to South Africa, and then they tell me, Chris, you know what, we're really sorry, but this is the wrong code. There's another deal that we were looking for that we were actually pursuing, and that is the one that you you facilitated. So, and therefore we cannot pay you. I'm like, oh my God, what? you can't be serious. And I had all these other guys that were waiting for money. And those are guys that are in the government, and I know that I'm I'm dead because, I mean, all these guys know each other. So if I want to do business with anybody, they're going to say I, I took the money and I didn't pay them. So you know what I had to do? I had to pay. I had to find a way to kind of pay them with my own money because otherwise it was over. And that was a really dark Christmas for me because, you know, I told myself, this is the lesson that you learn. Stick to your lane. Do what you're really good at. You know, these... Quick money, easy money, it's great, but you know, it didn't really work for me. And that was one of the things, it was a really sad Christmas because I had to take some of the profit that we've made, you know, to actually just really sort out these guys. I'm glad that I did because I managed to get some other business, some referral referrals from the same guys, you know, because I maintained that. So yeah, so I would say the right partnership, you know, that's one. You know, um I, I didn't get the right partnership and I really paid a great deal, you know, for that, and also trying to make quick and easy money. Yeah, I think I think very good way of summarizing the, the lessons from uh, from the question that was asked. Right partnerships, avoiding uh, quick, easy money, um, and, and like you said, you learned you learned the hard way. But it's also very interesting to hear you say that you're still waiting for your big break, even though you're actually in several African countries. It just goes to show that you cannot afford to sit back, um, and relax. Um, and, and, um, using Nelson Mandela's, but you cannot just, uh, you dare not linger when you think you've reached the top. Uh, you keep soldiering on uh, because there's always there's always more you can offer. There's always more uh, that you can uh, that you can. Um, Sylvia, uh, back to you. A few questions are coming through, um, and and uh, this relates to children supporting uh, children with special needs. Asman wants to know. Uh, what we can do in Kenya to influence the government to support that uh, that particular area uh, that is taking care of uh, children with uh, special needs. Um, and Mumbi also wants to know if food plays a part in managing um, autism. So two questions about children with special needs. Um, what we can do uh, to influence the government to do more, whether food uh, plays a part in managing um, autism. Okay, um, uh, let me start with the one for, for the government right now. Um, last week we sent a petition to try and see, that is some of the things we are taking advantage of at this moment. Uh, we send reports on this is actually what is on the ground, but I would like to just change it. For you as an individual, the best you can actually do is embrace the children with special needs. Be informed, be aware. Before we judge, just listen and understand because remember everyone here is either a brother or sister and has potential to be a parent and being a special needs parent is not something that you did something that actually why you deserve it god is the one who decides uh who he's going to give uh what kind of a child and even you as an individual you can be walking down you get knocked off and within that span of 30 seconds you become a person living with disability there is various disabilities so i always champion for us to embrace difference we are all all different and apart from that in uh the special needs space Focus, I, I use the statement, see the able and not the label. Just because I am autistic, that doesn't write me off from doing what I can. Just find what is that good thing about me and uh, we, we, we embrace it. And for, for you as corporates, because one of the challenges we have is that transition. 
right? We, we, we are not included in schools, even as we're talking about TVET, they've not put considerations of that. You see, autistic people, the fact that they follow routines, that means they're very good at things that are routine-like. They're very good at coding, they're very good at music. We all remember Cody D, the guy who won last year. Yeah, who was autistic and blind. Yeah, but you see what other countries have done, they have built up and set up their social security systems in a way that the children get what it is that they, they can, the caregivers get the support. And that way then you find the parent will have time and space to focus on the child and develop this child. They've put in the right schools. So if we, we just become the change makers in the very small way you can, because like even in Swahili, the way we say haba na haba hujaja kibaba, that means we will get there, but the change begins now and it starts with you as an individual. Make their life easier and I'm sure uh, even the government will be able to, because you're the future leaders. If you embrace it now, that means when you get to that space of leadership, you will have them in mind because we always find that special needs persons are like the last resort. You're thinking about a solution, you think about everyone. Then later when we start making noises like, oh yeah, by the way, there are these other guys, how do we fit them in, you know? So have that broad aspect mind of set that uh, if you're thinking, think very inclusive and equitably, right? Uh, when it comes to food, yes, if a child who is hyper, hyperactivity cut down on sugar the one thing that uh, the association that has been seen is that the the stomach and uh, the nervous system and the brain development actually come in hand in hand so that's why you'll see we'll have advice to keep off gluten because it's one of the most complex things for the stomach to process and uh, the, the gastro issues that you get and one for for the mothers or new mothers upcoming mothers let me just throw in a hint for you when you give birth and you find your child has jaundice you find your child is crying more than normal. You find they have insomnia. That is now issues with sleeping. And uh, you find that they're having issues with uh, the stomach. Just keep an eye, especially jaundice. Jaundice is one of the key indicators you'll find that uh, most of the people, most of the children require special attention after that. As much as we take it lightly, it's one of the key early indicators of autistic children. Then watch their diet. You take off milk. Um, and then you take off uh, gluten and take off sugar, you'll see better reception because at least now their system will be able to uh, focus more on other important function abilities of the body. But then also see a nutritionist so that you do not eliminate something that the child really needs. So uh, currently we are having a program at Bagati Hospital. You, she can, you can share my contact, then I can give you the person to see for free consultation on nutrition for neurodiverse community. Wow, thank you so much for the very great, great insights there. Um, Chris, uh, back to you. Beryl says it's a good lesson you learned on getting the right partners, uh, but her question is how do you tell uh, you got a wrong or right one? Uh, some can be nice at first and five years down the line, you start seeing the real characters uh, come out. So how do you tell that you are on the right position? Well, I wish there was a formula for this one, but um, uh, it's a, it's a, it's really an amazing question. But this is this is this is this is how I this is my summary. This is how understood how I understand it now. I told myself, look, if I get into a partnership with somebody now, it, it cannot be simply because um, they have maybe some necessarily some serious skill, you know, and I think I can tap into that and then grow. That's not enough. You know, we need to really make sure that your goals are aligned. It's so important because um, if you don't have the same convictions, you guys are going to have a problem at some point, you know? So for example, I do not believe in having a silent partner. You know, for me, it doesn't really make sense. I always go for strategic partner, meaning they're really adding something substantial to the business that really elevates the business to a completely different level. Otherwise, for me, it doesn't make sense. Now, um, and then, if we realize that we really need each other that much, you know, it's very difficult to break that. You know, um, uh, well, in the previous business that I that I had, that I think I, I lost, well, I haven't really lost, it's just that I've decided not to fight it. But um, so what happens is, you know, um, it was a lady and she got married and then the, the husband got into the picture and started questioning certain things that we had established. So all of a sudden, we're running the business, we're three partners running the business, you know, so it was very difficult. You know, so, and at the same time as well, I think what I've learned as well is you need to have the right processes in a business. There are certain things that a business just needs to do. 
You need to have a board. You need to have certain things in place that would really protect the business as well. You know, doing things the Joakali way, you know, it's just you and me. Let's, no, it just doesn't work. You know, so you need to really set up things properly. And if you do that, usually your business is protected. I don't want to be too technical, but something very simple that people take for granted is the members agreement, the shareholders agreement in a business. It's everything. You know, when you guys don't agree, you don't like each other anymore, how will you run with the business? You know, how would the business run? So it needs to be really, that is the first thing. When I meet someone that starts a business and that has partners, I tell them, listen, please make sure that your shareholders agreement is really tight. Because if you find you, you will not, money is the devil. Honestly, you know, when you're running a couple of millions, it's fine. When you start making a lot of money, people really change, you know, so yeah. So um, and if yeah. I'm making any sense, yeah, I think you're making um, um, a lot of sense, Chris. And I think just to add, um, and this is just from the experience we've had at Safaricom when it comes to partnerships, sometimes um, it's just the right time to let go uh, because sometimes partnerships start out with the very best of intentions, but uh, down the line, your goals drift, drift apart. It doesn't work. Just sometimes there are, it's a matter of knowing when to let go. We've had to uh, sort of uh, uh, do partnerships in the past. I remember we used to have a product called Linda Jami with... Uh, Parents company and it just reached a point where our goals and our visions were not allowed and we just had to uh, part ways so sometimes it's about um, knowing when to go partnerships and i know partnerships doesn't only exist in business but i also know in, in the world of uh, advocacy and, and ngo um uh, sylvia uh, if you back me there's also partnerships there and sometimes it's also important to know how to uh, 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 choose the right partners from your experience how was that how was that panda <laughs> Uh, let me let me give it now from a different now into the business perspective. Uh, when I started um, Tech Hub, I approached my former boss to be a partner, and uh, I really concur with what Chris is saying about the right partner because we usually look at maybe who's going to invest. I need you to put in money. I have the skill. So when you're choosing, you have to have the first thing I always say is have clear vision. You're all heading in the same same direction. You all want the same thing. And what are they bringing onto the table? Uh, because because like you said, silent investors sometimes can be the ones to just turn around and take you from like 100% to 40% because they're thinking that things are changing yet. They're not understanding what is actually going on on the ground. So that you have to really assess when you're choosing who you're going to partner with where do they want to get to go what skills are they bringing on the table and what's their their um, dream for the organization that way when you align that it makes life easier and also in the NGO space it's similar the same thing you find like for us we are very clear with the niche we're working with is persons with neurodevelopmental disabilities but then you'll find now you have these other people who are seeing you're doing such a great job at it and they want you now to start also doing other presentations and you see now that that's that um, deviates you from your point of focus so when you're starting a, a business I always say proper preparation actually actually always works well remember when I talked about um, knowing where you're going and worst case scenarios the best thing is always also to know where where um, what exactly do you want and draw the entire map then now work backwards and that also involves it includes the board members that you want what what is your weakness because these people who you're bringing on board are supposed to be your backup like they should be covering uh the skills that maybe you do not have they have to be bringing something that is very significant to the table and, and that's where you find it's a very symbiotic relationship instead of just uh, replication of duties thank you Absolutely, I think a uh, very nice way to sort of summarize uh, the whole partnerships um, question. Um, Chris, um, Linda has sort of a loaded question here, and it has to do with something that uh, we don't like talking about, even though we should be talking about it more often, um, and this is corruption. And she asks, as an entrepreneur, how do you set yourself apart from others, given that corruption levels are high in Africa, uh, to avoid uh, greasing hands? Thank you very much for this. This is something that I always have to deal with, you know, always have to deal with. And, you know, um, so th th there's something that I told myself early enough, and I'm sure it has costed me a lot of business before. I am 100 percent sure. You see, um, about two or three years ago, when I became a bit active online, you know, I started having a couple of videos. Some people call them uh, motivational videos. I call them my story. You know, I don't really think I'm a motivational speaker. So um, and I'm always talking about integrity, always talking about integrity. 
And there are lots of people that do not want to associate with me because I'm sure they believe that, you know, the conversation would not even start, you know? So, um, and I mean, you've seen, and we live in an environment and in Africa, and I know it's probably the same around the world. Corruption, bribes, this is, this is how business is done. You know, when you want to make the big bucks, you're going to get to a point where someone tells you, listen, um, this is what's gonna, this is how we do it. I remember in South Africa, I got some, I got some business with the government. We did the work, everything was perfect. Um, and, I, and at the end, when we were supposed to get the second part of our payment, the guy comes to me and tells me, okay, Chris, listen, this is how much we're gonna pay you, this is how much you're giving me, and you're going to give it to me in cash. You know, so, and I was stuck, you know, because I, I didn't know what to do, you know? And I hope you don't judge me, the people that are actually just connected here, but so, I paid him. I paid him, but I stopped working with them. You know, I stopped working with them because I, I just knew that it was going to get worse and worse. And this is the Department of Science and Technology in South Africa, a huge, you know, entity. And I was, I could make millions, but I just knew that when it starts that way, it is not going to stop. And then what happens is I'm from Cameroon. So people assume I'm from West Africa. And, you know, uh, West Africa has a, there's a bad connotation. The whole, oh, these guys are, this guy is from West Africa, even though I don't believe it's necessarily true. So there are always, you know, these things that pop up. Okay, so how can we do business, whatever? But I told myself one thing. If you excel, if you really, if you really know what it is that you do and you do it well, and you make sure as well that you communicate very well, because you see, that's the thing. People do, do business with, with people that they know. They don't necessarily do business with people that you know, are necessarily great at what they do as well. So you need to make sure that you communicate, you create those relationships, and that's it. You're going to get business. So corruption, I say no, because one way or the other, it's not going to work. Just let me add something. It's very important that I add this. I was contacted. Oh, my God, I'm going to get in trouble for this. I was contacted because there was a deal at KBC. I remember because I arrived here. We did the rebrand for Citizen. We're very famous. It was really good. I'm grateful. We got some other clients. We even got Safaricom like that, you know. Um, but what happened basically is some guy came and said there's a deal for there's a KBC deal. I think he was. He gave me some ridiculous amount. He said it's one billion. And I told him there's no way we charge one billion. What are we gonna do, you know? And he told me no, you know. So Chris, you know how it's done. And I told him I cannot. I just can't. And shortly after that, I started hearing about NYS and all these things, you know, and I told myself, okay, I'm, I'm happy that I didn't actually even, because I know that, you know, one way or the other, things come out, you know, and money that you earn like that, you can't really do anything, anything solid with it. So for me, it's a no, no, period. Absolutely. I think corruption is one of those um, areas that uh, I think people don't like talking about, uh, but it's so crucial. Um, at Safari Com, uh, one of the things that we pride ourselves in is being open and honest in, in what we do. And that's why um, every year we release a sustainable business report. And we talk about these things, talk about the number of uh, employees who've been let go because of issues of fraud um, and corruption. So it's something that uh, we, you know, we are also very, very passionate about uh, uh, doing business the right way. Um, uh, Sylvia, this is uh, for you, and it's about uh, children with special needs again. Uh, there's someone who's asking whether the government has, or any other body, has a database with children with special needs, um, and uh, adds that this could consolidate the efforts towards ensuring lasting solutions to these kids. Um, they say uh, they have two sisters. Um, it's an anonymous attendee, so they haven't given the name. But they say they have two sisters with kids, and whenever they visit government agencies with support, the impression they get is that there's no concern at all. Um, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, unfortunately, PWDs are considered as one of the minority groups. And you find, like I mentioned earlier, when people are making solutions or crafting solutions, we are the last to be thought about. I use the word we because if you're a parent and your child is disabled, you're double disabled uh, as a caregiver. Um, the database is not there per se, but with disabilities, your neighbors up here um, are trying to gather that by registering persons with disabilities and they get that, that, that special card. Although the process now for the neurodiverse community 
is tedious and that's one of the things we are talking about one it takes too long for us we need five doctors to actually verify our children deserve to be catered for so you see it's always fighting and that's the challenge with special needs based the neurodiverse community because it's not an obvious disability and um, you always even see this in the community we were hoping that the census would be something that will give us feedback but as, as we saw uh, it was for some like uh, and others it wasn't because the questions were not quite straightforward so there was that balance of trying to to use the correct language and at the same time we lost the the point as to why we want to know how many pwds we have so there isn't quite much but um we are hoping that um one of the as, as when the world opens up at least that registration will go on and uh, we'll be able to get better whatever results and uh, database for pwds Thanks, Dov, and I, and I have no doubt that with people like you uh, fighting uh, this fight, that this will be successful. I pray that it will be. Um, we'll take two, what, two last questions, and then we can go to any parting shots that uh, both of you may have. Um, Chris, I believe this is for you, and James wants to know some of the key items that you need to set up a business, apart from the right uh, board of directors. Any advice we can give them? Well, well, quite a broad question, but um, let me try to to actually make it okay. Yeah, so let let me go back to when I arrived in Kenya. You know, because you know I arrived here and I was fresh from South Africa. That's let's say 2009, and I'm told, Chris, um, you say you do digital, but there are lots of digital agencies here. So how do you think you're going to actually thrive here? So I told them, okay, and I knew that. The, the, I mean, for me to enter, to get into the market, innovation, innovation is what was going to really be my my strength. So I was fortunate enough. I came to Safaricom because I met the investor relations manager somewhere, and she told me what you're saying makes sense. Let's go and meet Michael Joseph. I'm like, okay. So here I, I entered the room and I sit with Michael Joseph, and he asks me three questions. The first question was, no, I think it was, yeah. So he said, where are you from? I said, South Africa. Who are your clients? I gave him the list of clients. And then he tells me, whatever it is that you're trying to give us, who else is doing it here? I said, no one. He said, let's do it. I'm like, wow. You know, just end. Because this was my pitch to him. I told him, it does not make sense to me that a company like Safaricom would print one million annual reports. This is ridiculous. It does not make any sense. You know, and I had built stuff like that before in South Africa. It was simple. It was just, how do we create a multimedia annual report and take it online, right? And make it really interesting and stuff like that so there was even a video of michael joseph and all that and when we did that that year it won an award you know best reporting in in africa then all the other years you know we were called you see how for me business is really about innovation and we were talking about corruption just now but if you are the first to be doing something you're definitely going to get business for me that's how i always look at it that way and most importantly your business you should, you're in business because you solve problems. So you cannot be in business because someone else is doing business. You're in business because you have something that you think can fix a particular problem. If you go, if you work with that in mind, you, I, I don't think, I think you will succeed. I think you'll yeah, find avenues like, to get a market. Yeah, I, I like that. I like what you're saying about solving problems and looking for something, looking for your niche. What are you offering that uh, the other people are not offering? Um, is it something new in the market or if it's not something new, are you offering it a different way? Um, and like you say, by the fact that some of these things that you offer in your business is not being offered by anyone else in the way that you're doing it, makes you stand out from uh, from the crowd. Um, uh, Chris, uh, back to you. Marcy wants to know whether you offer mentorship. Um, and I think depending on your answer, then we can uh, give her uh, details of um, how to go about it, uh, whether you offer any mentorship. To well, Mercy, <laughs> as I said, you know, for me, it's, and really no offense, but I don't, I, I, it's not that I don't believe in, in mentorship, but I think everyone has their path. And I definitely think, I believe in sharing my experiences, you know, and hopefully if, it, if they can inspire anyone, then that's fine. But to be honest with you, I think I find it very, um, I don't know, I, I don't find it right for me to call myself someone's mentor because it's 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 a lot of responsibilities it's a lot of, it's they need to live life through their their life through their own lives and 
at any point in time, I'm always open. I mean, I would like to get in touch with Mercy. I mean, we can talk for as much as you want, you know, as much as I have time, as, as, uh, as long as I have time. But mentorship, structuring it that way, I don't, I don't really say I do that. You know, I don't really say I do that, to be honest. But I talk to people, you know, so, yeah. So. Okay, safe answer. So, Mercy, if you want to talk to Chris, uh, reach out. and uh, I'm sure he can create some, uh, some time to, to talk to you. Um, again, Chris, for you, uh, sorry to put you on the spot. And then Sylvia will come to you for your parting talk, so you can sort of want to prepare that. Um, Gabriel wants to know, apart from your business partners, do you have other accountability partners and how do you manage a personal accountability? Yes. Sorry, there's something here. What about this one? Data? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. We can hear yeah, you. Sorry, there was something on my screen. Sorry, just repeat the question. There was something on my screen. Sorry, um, I'll go ahead and repeat. Gabriel wants to know, uh, apart from your business partners, do you have any other accountability accountability partners? And how do you manage uh, personal accountability? You know, to be honest, um, one, of the, one of the people that I've always, and throughout my life, and I'm very fortunate that I still have her, my mother, right? And the, I started the business, but she had a business when I was in Cameroon. She's an interior designer. She's always consulting me, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? And she kept on telling me, look, do things this way. Don't do this, never do this. So up to today, even though I have my board of directors, she actually is still my sounding board both personally and from a business point of view for some reason, you know, so, and we have conversations. She tells me, oh, Chris, now you have a big business, you know, now you should be advising me. But I say, no, I just ask her, so what do you think? What's your opinion on a particular topic? And usually we really talk as equals and, you know, normally we find a solution and a way forward and way forward. And because she's a little bit like a sister now, you know, so she keeps me accountable, really. You know, and um, so it has nothing to do with really my business partners, but really by talking to my mother and I tell her, look, today I did this. I've got this opportunity. I want to do this. And she asks me, OK, um, but is that really right? Though, you know, I mean, do, do you think that's the right thing to do? I mean, you decide. So that's the thing. But that's one way for me to cope with that. And then at the same time as well, I always tell myself, you know, I need to sleep at night. I need to sleep at night. I cannot live knowing that you know i've done this i've done that and people are after me for me it doesn't make sense the reason why i got into business was that i wanted freedom i do this because it's an illusion there's no such thing as freedom when you're an entrepreneur right but i wanted the illusion of freedom but i want to know that the little that i have is something that i've created myself right and i don't want to do all sorts of funny things for me i need to sleep at night as simple as that <laughs> All right, uh, thanks, Chris. We'll come back to you for your parting shot in just a moment. Um, Sylvia, before you give your parting shot, there's one more question. Um, someone wants to know, to know which are the best boarding schools for autistic children that teach life skills. Uh, they say they have an autistic brother and, uh, and, going and getting them a school is such a challenge. So how would you, what, what advice would you give in terms of boarding schools for children? Um, all right, thank you for the question, but... Uh, Sylvia, we seem not to be hearing you quite clearly, so we'll get back to you. Uh, for Hello. That, for I, that, I for think that. I got kicked out of something. <laughs> okay, we can hear Hello? you now. Uh, just go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. We can hear you now. Yeah, go <laughs> All right, okay, that was a good surprise. <laughs> So generally, school is one of the greatest challenges that we have in the space for special needs. Uh, getting the right school is one is a challenge because with special children, there has to be chemistry. They have to be comfortable with the environment. Then there is something we called early assessment centers or EACs. That's the first step. You go there, then the child is assessed, the brother in this case. Then they know where to best place them. About boarding, I wouldn't find that as the best solution because there is the things that at this point in time in their development, they need family more. 
segregation and seclusion is not the best solution. And at this COVID time, when it comes to life skill, that is something you as a family in the family setup can easily do because life skills is one of the easiest things that uh, the support system, that is the immediate family can, can do. When you're talking about life skills, I hope you're it depends with what level of um, development they are at because you see for example my child who's 10 is 10 because the chronos say he's 10 but his capabilities and abilities are clustered under four year old five year old i have to help him dress uh you need to have those affirmations and teach him some of these small things because of their fine motor skills and gross motor skills these are things you can still be doing at home and also can be assessed, assisted by therapy so as much as i know we have jacaranda here in kilelashwa we have joy town in thika those are the ones that I've, I've had from other parents who've taken their kids that are okay but for autistics it's very hard those ones take mostly cerebral palsy They're, these are the kids who are on the wheelchairs and stuff like that but um we can you can share my contacts then maybe we can take through because if, if you get to understand the child then you know the best place uh, to have them but don't look at it like it is hard to have them around take it and embrace them as they are so did you want me to combine that with my parting shot i will get back to you i think um, as you think about it uh, as you think about your parting shot we'll go to chris so that he can give his uh, chris remember the topic today was uh, just how to adapt to change and overcoming personal challenges. And I think you've done a very good job in just sharing your story. But what parting shot would you have? It could be a quote, it could be um, some powerful words, it could just be bye and thank you. But what parting shot would you have for us? Okay, bye and thank you. No, I'm joking. Um, so, <laughs> so, 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 so here's the thing. Um, I think there are two things that I would like to say, if you'll, if you'll allow me. Um, you know, when I... And I remember it was one of my employees that asked me that question one day. And he asked me, Chris, so when you're doing this business thing, so what happens if you don't have clients anymore? What if now the business just dies, you know? And 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 I remember my answer because I truly believe it, you know? And I don't know how many of in the audience, I mean, have their side hustles or, they, or their businesses, but my answer was, look, I've got some incredible amount of experience. So the worst thing that can happen to me is to get a job. So technically speaking, I'm not taking any risk. There's no risk, really. So if it doesn't work, I'm going to go get a job, you know, get a bit more money and then come back again and then start the business again. So for the people that are actually employed now, you are in the best possible position to start a business now because you have a backup. The biggest businesses, Google and so on, were started with, by people that already had a, that were working for a business and then, you know, they left when their business picked up. So this is one thing. For, I mean, this is an opportunity for you. The second thing and the last thing that I always say, and I think that is the thing that has helped me, and it's something that my mother taught me, do not dwell on things. Something happens to you, deal with it. You know, face it, deal with it, and move on. That's how I live my life. And that's how I like to, to really end this. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, Sylvia, to you, uh, what parting shot do you have for us? Um, I'm trying to, I usually have so many angles of life now specifically for <laughs> specifically for today's lesson i think i'd said it earlier but uh know yourself understand what you're good at understand your talents and not everything that comes to you that looks bad now is actually bad because if you combine whatever challenge and like uh chris has said you need to identify opportunities find out the why you know when we're talking about why is this happening to me we always think about it oh why me not why you why not you is the other option why not you so you deal with it you learn from it and grow take your talent take the life experiences that you have combine it with that one thing that you're very passionate about and then you'll be able to find your purpose in life and also there was another question i think we had had about balancing everything invest in your social capital because um, if I look around in all the things that I've been able to do, it's always about the relationships that we have in life that escalate you in places and get you through tough times, through situations, either in business, personal life, and learn to empower your uh, support system. That is uh, for employers, the people you have employed at home, that nanny, make, make sure they can drive, make sure they understand. Let them be a better person because directly and indirectly, we will always support each other and have a plan know where you're going and uh, map it out even if you don't get there you need to break it down a bit more but just never give up 
keep at it and not everything negative is always negative just find that uh, light at the end of the tunnel and we just wish it's not an oncoming train <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> I think so, guys. If you forget everything that uh, Sylvia and Chris have said, uh, let me just summarize what they have said in their parting shots. Uh, Chris has said it, you're in the best possible position to start a business if you're thinking about going into business. Um, you're in the best possible position because you already have a job, um, and a business can be the thing you do at the side. Uh, he also said, do not dwell on things, and I think uh, Degu has uh, uh, sort of. Uh, summarize it do not dwell on an issue deal with it and move on uh great things um it's really it's great insights right there but i think sylvia um instead of asking why you ask why not you invest on social capital so i think if we forget everything remember those few nuggets of wisdom uh but i think it's been awesome um you guys have been really insightful and inspiring i don't think we forget anything that you uh, mentioned um to us today we just like to close the session with what we call um, um intimeter just to see what guys have picked from this session so no pressure chris and sylvia um we just want to see what guys think about the session um, and uh, how much they've appreciated it so i'll ask my colleagues to go once again to www.com enter that code one two two eight seven six one we'll answer some very few questions as we wind up um and then call it a day uh, go to menti.com, use that code one two two six seven six one. <clears throat> some uh, two or three questions, sum up to sum up the presentation. Um, so on a scale of one to ten, how helpful was this session to you? On a scale of ten, how helpful was this to you? Um, and I always like to see the reaction of the speakers when we put up this question. <laughs> One of those where you're getting instant feedback. Um, and thanks to technology, uh, able to do this. So I can see uh, 9.6 so far. So I think uh, you guys are really appreciating the, uh, the session and some of the insights they got from this. So well done, Chris, and Sophia for a, a very inspiring and insightful session. Uh, the next question is What is your biggest learning session? I can see why not me? integrity, uh, not to dwell on an issue, resilience, integrity again. So those are some of the learnings that people have picked up. Positive attitude is key. Um, do not dwell in the past. Uh, resilience, um, again, coming out. Uh, find your strength. Uh, integrity, again, coming out. So lots of lessons that guys have picked. Purpose and know thyself. Uh, and the last question, topics that you'd like to be covered in the future. Um, I can see a smiley face. I'm not sure what that is, <laughs> what topic that is, but uh, I can see mental health, work-life balance, how to tackle corruption. Wow, that's a big one. Um, how to single parent a boy, uh, nurturing children. Uh, so keep typing. Um, even as we close, uh, keep uh, giving us the responses. Uh, we usually um, sort of consolidate these responses and they help us um, identify the future topics uh, for future discussions. Remember, we do this every Thursday uh, from 3 p.m. Um, just pick topics where we think we can come together uh, through, the, through this digital platform and exchange views, ideas, and hear from, uh, from our speakers. Um, so I think with that, I just want to once again to thank Chris and Sylvia for their insights, uh, for that inspiration inspiration uh, for all the uh, for all the lessons we've learned today and I think I just want to uh, sum it up with one of the feedback that we've, we've uh, received from Mumbi um, who says learning so much from the guests today thanks for such insightful lessons from Sylvia on taking care of children with special needs and from Chris on running a business um, and remember today was just all about learning how we can overcome um, challenges, how we can overcome change, uh, especially given that the period we're in, um, where we um, are apart uh, uh, from each other, we're working from home, um, uh, it was important to just sit back and, and just think about how we can overcome uh, some of these uh, challenges that we faced. And like I said, when we started, change can be messy at the, uh, the start, um, but at the end, it's glorious. So thank you very much, everyone, and do enjoy your evening.